let's talk a little bit about wokeism and racism. So this video is a response to comments on the Mandisa video, specifically by a man named Jason Torpy. Jason and I were once friends, good friends, uh, and uh, we went separate ways as far as wokeism was concerned, and he has uh, made some comments on this video. I'm putting it publicly because I want the points to be made clear, and I want him to see it, but I also want you to see the points of really what drives my motivation when I say I'm not woke. Um, I'm going to show that this case that Mandisa is having right now uh, is a great case study for the failure of wokeism and, uh, I mean, for the writ large failure of wokeism. Um, and I want to start out by saying, first of all, um, Jason Torpy is a good guy. He's not stupid. And I'm certainly not trying to incite any sort of pig pile on him. Um, he's not a bad guy. He's just misled. I, when I wrote Fighting God, I wrote um, that religious people weren't stupid. They were just wrong. Jason is one of those people, as is so many well-meaning, woke people who really don't see the error of their ways. And I'm going to use this video not to inflame my relationship with Jason, but to persuade him to change. And I think he's going to watch it. I hope he's going to watch it. And, uh, you know, Jason, if you do watch this, please make yourself a comment and put it on and I'll pin it uh, if I can. If I can pin somebody else's comments, I actually don't know if I can do that. Let's get into definitions, okay? Racism is a form of bigotry. It means assigning an, uh, an attribute to a race that is not attributable to the race. Okay? That's what it means. Okay? It's not bad. Racism isn't bad because it's inherently evil. Racism is bad because it's incorrect. And when you use that incorrect basis as a basis for other information, for other assumptions, you grow this second-class person in your mind. And that's why it's wrong. That's, and, and so that's the function of bigotry. That's the bad part about racism. It's not about you're bad because you think there's differences in the races. It's about you're incorrect. You're factually incorrect. And if you're saying things like, you know, like all people of one race are lazy or stingy or whatever, you are incorrect. And you're building your worldview upon that incorrect assumption. Now, some people like to rename the word racism so they don't have to be called racists. Uh, this is very common in the African-American community. Renaming the word, saying, oh, well, um, now power plus bigotry equals racism. Well, that doesn't erase the fact that imbuing a feature to a race is incorrect, okay? You can play and pretend that there's no racism in one direction or another, and you can play pretend that you can that you can just assign all whites are racist and that's a racist thing, and you can deny that that's a racist thing, but you're actually doing the racist thing. You're actually imbuing a, a trait onto the race. It's factually incorrect. That's why Robin D'Angelo's book is wrong. That's where Robin D'Angelo's book falls off a cliff. It's when it becomes racist. So there's a big difference in what I mean when I say the black culture, the black race and the African-American culture. Uh, and I want to make that distinction clear before I continue, um, because a lot of what we are seeing is the African-American culture calling criticism on itself racism when it's not. It's criticism of behavior. And then liberal, well-meaning white people say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And what you're seeing here is just that writ large, and I'm just going to show it to you. And before I get begin, I want to tell you a little bit about Jason. Now, Jason and I, like I said, were friends for a long time. We've done many things together. When I was president of American Atheists, he was president of the Military Association of Atheists and Freethinkers, MAF. And, you know, back in the day when we 
did Reason Rally 2 and the other things, um, we had our market segments. We had our segments inside inside the movement. You know, I was the brash one, the, those tip of the spear, um, and somebody else was the nice one, and somebody else was the litigious one. And Jason was the one who worked with others. That was his niche. That was his leadership. Uh, the idea that we could work with believers uh, and attain our goals. He was really the, the, the drum beater in the movement. And I am absolutely sure that I got some of my tolerance from him. I learned from Jason Torpy. Um, I was led by him in this way. And the reason that I wanted to just point this out is because what you're going to see is that, that well, Jason, you've changed, not me, okay? Um, maybe I've changed. I'm not saying I haven't changed, but buddy, you used to be the leader in somebody. You used to be the person in the movement who would be the first to say working with believers is productive. Working with believers gets results. You used to say that. You said, all right, we put our differences aside. We get our things in there. We get the things done. And it wasn't Kathy. It wasn't Mikey. It was you. It wasn't anybody else. You were the guy who, who was doing this. And I, I learned from you, man. And so having said that, having said that, let's get into what happened. Okay. Mandisa Thomas is African-American uh, president of Black Nonbelievers. Uh, she's also a person of note. She's been doing this for a dozen years. Um, she was at Reason Rally 1, Reason Rally 2, and uh, she's got a lot of accomplishments under her belt. She hasn't done a lot recently, but she does have a lot of accomplishments under her belt, and she is due credit for that. Uh, she's on the board of the AHA, which is a large, uh, probably the oldest nonprofit organization, and there was a group of African Americans who wanted, who a volunteer group inside the AHA. I don't know the, all the details, uh, who wanted to have um, a say in the election of the next executive director. Now, that is a very cute request for somebody who doesn't know anything about nonprofits. But anybody and everybody out there who knows anything about nonprofits know that they have bylaws and that the board execs the executive director and it is their prime objective. It is their number one duty. And you can't just delegate that. You can't choose to delegate that. To delegate that is, um, I'm, it's a dereliction of duty to delegate that, that primary job. Jason knows that. But what happened was these people asked this request, made this request, and um, they were told no. And Mandisa apparently told them that there was a conflict of interest possibility. Now, if you uh, know anything about nonprofits, anything at all, you know that conflicts of interest is a real issue and that every board member has the responsibility to raise the issue of conflicts of interest if they see it. Uh, and it's not an offensive statement. Uh, I have been told that I had a conflict of interest. I haven't asked about conflicts of interest many times. I have asked other people about conflicts of interest many times. It's not an aggressive statement. It's not an insult. It's normal course of business. And so this volunteer group was told, no, you can't get, you, you can't be in there. And by the way, for a, a number of reasons, they were probably told conflicts of interest was the, was one of the reasons. And what resulted was this terrible paper that I talked about on the last video. This 14-page, I called it a 14-page pile of shit, and I stand by that description. Not because it's poorly written. Not because it's written incompetently. It's not. It's because the substance of this is bullshit. This is the person who says, oh, I was, I was harmed. I was harmed by being told that I had a conflict of interest. And I hated on this plenty last time. And what happened was that um, Jason came back and said, hey, you know what? My wife, Krista, wrote that letter. Oh, I didn't realize that. Um, but that doesn't change my opinion of the letter. 
And he pointed out that there was a time difference, that I had made a mistake, that this, this set of tweets from Diane B was about that and not from the most recent thing that happened more recently. Okay. And so I hated on this tweet thread and, you know, I, I, made, I made fun of it. Um, and Jason pointed out that I was, that it wasn't about this old thing, it was about this new thing with Mandisa, that this thing happened a couple years ago and that this, this whole big issue happened with Mandisa recently. This is, a, this is a, a case study for the failure of wokeism to support the African-American community because of racism against the black race. I'll show you. Now, um, I'm just going to... He got some... Conf he, got, he was confused up here. I, Jason, I, I wasn't even talking about Krista. I was not being facetious at all. I was showing you that there were two ways to handle a response, okay? If... Now, you criticized me on this. Now, there's two ways that I can handle it. I can say, thanks for your criticism. Um, here's my response. And, or I could say, you know, you've harmed me. I could say you've harmed me. Now, now let me tell you something, Jason. What you wrote here did not harm me. What you wrote here did not harm Chris. It didn't harm me at all. It was critical of me. You challenged me. In fact, you insulted me, which you really shouldn't do. But you didn't harm me after all, now did you? Now, given the fact that you didn't harm me at all, what if I were to lie and say you did? What if I were a malicious self-serving narcissist who couldn't take no for an answer, who couldn't take criticism. What if I were an adult child and I said, you harmed me, not because you had harmed me, but because I knew it would fuck with you, because I knew you only had one response, which is to cave. What if I told you you harmed me in a malicious attempt to better myself. And if I did it publicly, would that not be an assault on you? Would that not be me committing an immoral act? And would that not be an assault on you? If I did something, and if you and I had an exchange and it didn't harm me at all, and I made up some shit because I couldn't handle it, Okay, so it's one thing if you punch me in the face. It's one thing if you dox me or do something that harms me. But let's just say we're talking like adults. Let's say we're talking professionally. Let's say you were in the military and you made a request to your, to your superior and your superior said, no, that's against the rules. Would you tell your superior that he was harming you? No, Jason, you would not. Because that kind of pathetic, weak behavior is beneath you. It's beneath me, too. It's beneath all people that we should want around us. But two years ago, when this Diane B. wrote this piece of shit with your wife. She said that Mandisa had harmed her by, access, by, by, by mentioning that there could be a conflict of interest and insulted her by telling her no. Made her feel useless and sad. That is a false allegation. That's an assault against Mandisa. That's definitely, Jason, an assault against Mandisa. There was no harm. This woman's not been harmed at all by anyone. Mandisa's harmed nobody here. And, now, and, 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 and you collapsed, you, you applauded it, you defended it two years later, man. Behavior that would be beneath you is fine for them because they're black, right? Because they're black. Because 
when you I look at your look at your response here to this. I got this little paragraph, this paragraph here. Naming harm which you heckle so strongly is a pretty basic part of the reconciliation process. Uh-huh. Sometimes people see the harm automatically and sometimes they need to be told. Uh-huh. People have told me lots of times how I've harmed them and I got to apologize when otherwise I wouldn't have even known. Sometimes I even thought they were being too sensitive or that they were seeing bad intention when there was none. But I apologized anyway. And that was easy and right. No, sir. It was not. There is a third option, you know. There is, a, there is another option, you know, when somebody says you've harmed them. That option is, I fucking did not harm you. Quit complaining. How about that? How about if I went up to you, Jason, and told you face to face that this had harmed me? You would tell me where to shove it. And if I did it, if you did it to me, I would tell you where to shove it. Because that's bullshit. And you know it. But you kowtowed to it only for black people. That is your white guilt. And you know you're being manipulated. Do you not think black people can have bad intentions? Do you not think black people can lie? Because that's racism, you know. Black people can be evil pieces of shit just like whites. To say otherwise is racism. But your worldview doesn't allow for that. If, you, if Your worldview says, okay, those people who are bad, we're going to pretend you're not there because you're black, so everybody is going to tell me the truth all the time and never try to manipulate me. And you've apologized and apologized and apologized even when you weren't sorry, dude. Even when you didn't agree, you weren't sorry and you apologized because they were black, man. That's the only reason you did it. And that's not justice. That's not right. That's 0% the right thing to do. It's lying. It's dishonesty, man. It's dishonesty. That's what you do when you apologize for things that you're not sorry for. How about this? How about the option that you call them on their shit? How about you grant them the possibility of being evil pieces of shit just like whites? Grant them equality. And when they come at you with shit, you call them on the shit. You tell them to fuck off with that shit, man. I haven't been harmed. Now, now what happened? Now, now look. This woman, Diane. This woman, Diane, let's just put it on the table here. She's clearly a not major performer, okay? A person who performs doesn't wallow in pity. This person wallows in pity. This person has never been told no. This person is a poor performer. I'm just going to say it. By, from what I can judge from her, from her tweets, and from what she has done, this is not a person who has a lot of accomplishments, okay? Now, as a leader... You have a poor performer. You have three options. You can teach, you can fire, or you can leave them alone. If you teach, you'll get improvement. If you fire, they're gone. If you leave them alone, stagnation happens. Stagnation happens. So two years ago, this same woman, okay, was a part of this whole thing about, and she was so upset. And so upset because she had been insulted by told by being told that she had to obey the rules. And two years ago, Jason, you said, yay, you. You said that. You said, hey, I'm going to cheer you on, Diane. I'm yes, man, you were, man, Disa harmed you. Yeah, you said it and it's impossible for you to lie or to be crazy, or to be a bitch because you're black. That's not racist. And so, Jason, you said yes. You said yay. You and a whole bunch of people applauded an extremely low bar for somebody because of the color of their skin. You imbued an, uh, an attribute onto her because of the color of her skin that she couldn't handle constructive criticism. She couldn't handle being told no. She couldn't grow. 
Now, let me ask you, and, and, and what's happened now? Two years later, two years later, there was this other incident, this other incident that I don't, but here's what I know about this other incident. It, it happened on a, on a, on a cruise ship. Uh, there was no physical touch. Uh, there was nothing sexual and no laws have been broken. In other words, nothing fucking happened again. And the same person who made a big deal out of zero things two years ago is making a big deal out of it now. Talking about how much she's being bullied and how much Mandisa's is hurting her over nothing. Over nothing. Just like two years ago. That is African-American stagnation because of wokeism. What would have happened, Jason, if somebody had sat her down two years ago and said, Listen, Diane, you got to stop this. Okay, Mandisa didn't hurt you. Mandisa didn't harm you. You got told no. Lick your wounds. Pick up your stuff. And we'll fight an another day. What if somebody had just told her that? Would she be doing this again today? Or would she have upped her game? Possibly. She might have quit. She might be unable to up her game. But she might be able to. She might be brilliant. She might be completely capable, but you're not giving her the incentive because of your well-intentioned racist actions. And I don't like to use that word. I just want to show you what you're doing. You're treating her differently because of her race. And that is holding her down. And this is an analogy for how wokeism holds down the African-American population writ large. Okay, poor performers, do not need to be coddled. They need to be treated like adults and challenged and pushed and not applauded when they fail, not applauded when they do bullshit moves like this. That's not helping. That's not justice. It certainly isn't social justice. It's not any kind of justice. It's harm. You know, Jason, there's a lot of animosity between wokists and non-wokists and especially non-woke liberals like me. This is why. Because you turn away the blind eye. You turn away. You moved completely away from the Jason Torpy who used to listen to people outside of his ages. And you have now become a Jason Torpy who never, ever does. And look at what it's done for you. Look at what this behavior is doing for the African-American community right in your immediate area. Stagnation. Useless arguments, bittering, bickering over nothing. She is trying to find right now a reason to bicker against Mandisa, who has caused her no harm ever. She has caused her no harm ever. And she's trying to make a case for her harm so she can have more pity because non-performers like pity. Non-performers deal in pity. That's how they survive. That's how they keep their positions. Pity. But that's not needed here. What's needed here is encouragement. What's needed here is guidance. What's needed here is, is sitting down with these people and saying, Let's, look, look at this, okay? Take no for an answer. You're fine. You haven't been injured. You haven't been harmed. In fact, you've gotten one one millionth of what I've got. So stand up. Stop complaining. Stop throwing rocks at people inside your movement and work together with people inside and outside your movement for our common goal. Productivity. What do you think this person, Diane, would be doing right now if she had been talked to like an adult two years ago? What do you think she'd be doing right now? She'd be doing something more productive, wouldn't she? Do you see it, Jason? Do you see that your turning away from other people has made you a less productive person? And that when you turn away people who will criticize you, who will call you on your shit, you get into a rut like this and you stagnate like this. It's gross that you support it. It's not okay that you support it. It's not moral and it's not good at all for the African-American community. This is the kind of thing that holds the African-American community back. We do our brothers and sisters no favors if we coddle them, if we tell them that failure is an option, if we tell them that mediocrity is victory, 
And if we tell them that, that they have a lower threshold for success than everybody else, a lower threshold for moral behavior than everybody else, it's not just harmful, it's not just wrong, but it has results, negative results, that I hope you can see, that I hope you can see right now. So that's all I've got for today. Uh, thanks for listening. And uh, Jason, like I said, uh, if you have any um, comments, you're more than welcome to leave them. I wish you well. Take care.